Welcome back. We are going to move on to Unit 7 and 8. This will be the final unit that uh, you have to cover for women's health. When you are looking at your book, and I would have your book readily available, we are going to be looking at chapters 24 through 28. When you are looking at the physiologic adaptations from the birthing process, things you need to think about are, first of all, this is going to typically occur within about six to eight hours after delivery. It, the infant during this time really warrants careful observation. Um, even though most neonates go through these adjustments and do quite well, we still need to be paying attention to specific things. And obviously we're always gonna start with airway. So establishing and maintaining those respirations, adjusting to circulatory changes. We talked about how the neonate circulation is in utero, so we need to ensure that the neonate makes that transition to extra uterine life. Regulating temperature is gonna be hugely important. If our babes are not able to maintain that temperature, we're going to use radiant warmers, skin to skin, and make sure that we have them nice and warm. Obviously, eating and elimination are going to be other things that we are going to be cognizant of. And then watching that weight. We want to ensure that that our newborns aren't losing too much weight and hopefully starting to make that curve to gain weight. Behavioral tasks, obviously we want to establish a relationship with the parents and the newborn transition really occurs in three stages. So the first is going to really be up to about 30 minutes after delivery and that's where we see the infant being very alert and active. The second stage starts after that first 30 minutes and we see the infant being very, much more or less aroused we see them getting sleepier and kind of starting to develop some sleep patterns. And then that third stage is going to be a reactive stage and that is usually occurring anywhere from two to eight hours after delivery. We will we'll see that um, during this time that there will be different types of sleep cycles. So with the REM cycle, things like that. And a lot of times it's just a really great time for bonding with mom and dad. As we have drilled into your heads, respiratory is going to be the most critical adjustment that this newborn is going to need to require and maintain. When baby is in utero, we know that carbon dioxide and oxygen gas exchange occurs in the placenta. So once that newborn is delivered and the cord is clamped and cut, that's what we're going to see raising that pressure with inside the fetal lungs and that also causes an increase in blood pressure which increases circulation and lung perfusion so really it's that first one or two breaths that that newborn is taking after delivery the four major stimuli that occur during the respiratory um, functionality are going to be chemical factors mechanical thermal and then sensory factors and really it's not one single factor that's going to make a difference it's going to be all four of them and we're going to spend a little time talking about each of them so with the mechanical stimuli we're going to see decreased secretions um, lung fluid in those first two to four days uh, before onset of labor. So we see the neonate not having quite as much fluid in the lungs. It's, you know, the, the neonates or the fetus's way of preparing for labor and delivery. When the mom delivers vaginally, we do see a compression of the chest during that vaginal birth. So it's like a squeeze and that squeeze or compression causes increased intrathoracic pressure which helps draw air into the lung when that pressure is released so when you think about that think about the garden hose that you squeeze really really tight and then that's the fetus coming out of the birth canal and then all of a sudden we release that garden hose and that's the baby being born now we see um, a decrease with that pressure so that helps to promote lung expansion and with lung expansion we see an increased production of surfactant and we've talked about surfactant many times that's going to be the going to be necessary to keep that alveolar expansion during um, life and so we see that increased pressure in the alveoli with respirations and that also helps with surfactant to keep the alveoli open chemical stimulation that's going to be related to carbon dioxide and oxygen levels of also the pH when the clamping of the umbilical cord occurs. So with that increase in carbon dioxide, we see a stimulation of the medulla 
And with that increase of carbon dioxide, we that causes the diaphragm to contract, which will also make the air into the lungs and create lung expansion as well. So the chemical stimuli are really going to be based on uh, blood pH um, and then elevated levels of, of CO2 and decreased levels of, of oxygen. The thermal environment, you know, when you think about that fetus living in utero for nine months, they're very thermal controlled. They live in a very nice, warm, safe, soft, quiet environment. Um, once the baby is born, obviously the, the room of the delivery or the temperature, I'm sorry, of the delivery room is much colder than what it is in the womb. And so that um, stimulating nerve endings will also help promote fetal respiration. Thing we, things we need to be cognizant of is if this baby gets too cold, which is called cold stress, it can cause respiratory depression. So be thinking of ways how we're going to prevent that. What are we going to do so we don't cold stress these babies um, once they're born? We want to keep them nice and warm, but we don't want to overbake them either. When you're thinking about the sensory stimuli, obviously look at there's hands on the baby, the baby's hanging out in the air, then the baby's going to be either placed on mom's chest or taken to the awaiting warmer and blankets are going to be rubbing. So all of that different activity is going to provide sensory stimulation. So obviously the baby goes through some pain associated with birth and delivery. So if you have a baby that... Um, takes a little while to get through that transitional period. Could be that maybe it's been a stressful delivery or a very rapid and quick delivery and it almost like stuns the baby. So lots of different things that we've talked about are going to promote uh, fetal well-being once that baby is born. Respiratory characteristics, typically you can be rest assured that the normal respiratory rate of the newborn is 30 to 60 breaths per minute. You will see periods of periodic breathing. That's why it's important to listen to respirations for at least 30 seconds, if not a full minute. Um, immediately after delivery until uh, probably 15 minutes, 30 minutes, we will see maybe some tachypnea. And then after the baby has been stabilized, we should see that respiratory rate continuing to decrease until it is within the normal limits. The newborn lung sounds should be clear and equal bilaterally once we have gotten through that transition period. So initially, you're probably going to have some wet, crackly sounding lungs until we get all of the amniotic fluid out of those fetal lungs. And so by doing that, we use some percussion. We encourage the baby to cry. You might have to use the bulb suction, uh, just different things to help clear respiratory secretions. With the cardiovascular aspect of the newborn. We've talked in prenatal parts of women's health how fetal circulation is all directed away from the fetal lungs. So after that first breath occurs, that oxygen level increases pulmonary vessels to dilate and we see lung expansion which helps reduce that pulmonary vascular resistance. So with that first breath, there is an increase in av alveolar capillary distension, and that's caused by those lungs inflating. The pulmonary artery pressure drops, and the pressure in the right atrium decreases. There is usually increased pulmonary blood flow from the left side of the heart, which then increases pressure in the left atrium, and then that will cause functional closure of the foramen ovale. So, Moving on to the next slide and discussing a little bit about closure of that foramen ovale, we did talk that crying can reverse the flow through the foramen temporarily, and we might see um, some fetal sci or some mild cyanosis in that newborn. But once you get that newborn calmed and quieted down, um, then you, the, the cyanosis will eventually go away. So remember from prenatal that that foramen ovale is a flap in the septum between the right and left atria. And that foramen ovale has allowed blood flow to be shunted away from the lungs for the prior nine months. We see functional closure within a few minutes after birth and then permanent closure could take up to three months. So it is kind of normal that you may hear a murmur with the, the foramen ovale closing. When we talk about closure of the ductus arteriosus, again, just to be repetitive, 101 in utero, that blood is shunted away from the fetal lungs. So with the ductus 
arteriosis, we see that constricting in response to elevated oxygen levels and then circulating prostaglandins. If our baby is hypoxic or has asphyxia or prematurity, we can see that ductus opening back up due to low oxygen levels. So it's important that we do have oxygenation um, improvement and stabilization in the newborn so that uh, ductus arteriosus remains closed. Pulmonary vessel changes occur with clamping of the umbilical cord. So once that umbilical cord is clamped, we see pulmonary vessels dilating in response to the increased need of oxygen or the increase of oxygenation. Fetal lung fluid is then going to be shifted to interstitial spaces and allow for promotion of increased blood flow to the lungs. So when you're thinking about that uh, fetal lung fluid, just remember that it's important for that newborn to cry and oftentimes parents are like, oh, we don't want them to cry and we don't want them to um, feel, feel bad or be noisy or things like that. But it's really important to help clear that fetal lung fluid and increase the perfusion within that, the newborn's lungs. When we're talking about newborn heart rate, things you need to remember is that a normal heart rate is again going to be 110 to 160 beats per, mi per minute. When you find an abnormal fetal heart rate, it's always important to go back and reassess in you know, 10, 15 minutes, up to 30 minutes. In that first initial transitional period, it's going to be normal to see a fetal heart rate up to at least 180. But as the baby goes through that transition period, we sh should see that coming back down to 110 to 160. You may see fluctuations and that's really normal. Uh, so you want to make sure that you are assessing the apical heart rate for at least one full minute and um, listening for any murmurs and then if you find any murmurs making sure that you're getting that noted in the chart as well as passed along to the physician. So this talks about your normal vital signs. The only thing we haven't addressed was temperature and what we like to see is 97.7 to 99.1. We do not want to cold stress these newborns. We don't want to overheat these newborns. So using a skin probe or axillary temperature is probably what you're going to see done most frequently. With blood pressures of the newborn, um, typically the average is going to be 60 to 80 systolic and 40 to 50 diastolic. Once um, the baby has stabilized, it's important to get a set of blood pressures. Typically what you're going to do is one, pressure, one blood pressure on an upper limb and one on a lower limb. If you have a baby that is not doing well, not making it through that transitional period very well, seems to be unstable, it's important to get a blood pressure on all four limbs and doing some comparison. If you have a very um, prominent change from pressures limb to limb, meaning upper limbs to lower limbs, sometimes what that can le could lead your practitioner to think is coarctation of the great vessels. So it's really important to get those baseline um, blood pressures and get all of those initial vital signs documented so that if something does go wrong, we can reflect back to those. Hemologic, uh, hem hematologic adaptations. The fetal red blood cell does have a shorter life and we see a fetal hem hemoglobin and hematocrit generally higher than what your adult is. Um, it's very normal to have elevated white blood cells and that doesn't mean that they have an infection. If they're going to rule out infection in a newborn, they're going to add a C-reactive protein as well as uh, blood cultures. So just because we see those elevated white counts, we don't, we're not going to be alarmed. Um, average blood volume is 80 to 85 milliliters per kilogram. So it does talk about a nine pound baby having about 320 mils of blood volume. And then lastly, um, when you're thinking about hematologics and variables with hematology reports, if we're doing a heel stick, we can see that we have higher values. So it's important to make sure that heel is warm. So using a heel warmer uh, can help with that. A venous puncture is always going to be more accurate, but the downside of that is it's really it can be really difficult to obtain. So unless you have a really good lab tech, you a lot of times we'll just see heel sticks being done. Timing of the um, clamping of the umbilical cord and then position of the newborn right before clamping of the umbilical cord can cause some variables. We will move on. Um, 
talking about modes of heat loss and thermal regulation.